The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. Know from wherever you're sitting, with whatever congregation you may normally be affiliated, that you're always welcome to join us here for worship. I do want to mention that we are continuing our in-person worship at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Uh, We have distancing and mask wearing and separated seating here in the sanctuary. If you would like to try that out, know that you are welcome. But please, if you feel any hesitation, especially health-wise, you may continue sitting right where you are and enjoying us and participating uh, in that way. I do want to thank all of our team leaders and committee people, committee leaders, who submitted such wonderful video clips in celebration of our rally day last, last Sunday. So thank you so much. I know a lot of effort went into that, and I have a special shout out to our own Rachel King, who is splicing all those things together and recording this service uh, even today. We are graced today to have the musical offering being given by our choral scholars who are singers up at the College of Worcester. Uh, We, our our choral music is so enriched by their participation with us and we uh, wish them and their college colleagues well. We want them to be well in uh, in this dangerous time. And finally, our beautiful flowers are given today by Carol McKiernan, and she is dedicating them to all first responders and all those folks, and some of them may be you, who are helping uh, keep us safe and sanitized, uh, including our own custodial staff here at church. So on Carol's behalf, I say thank you, and uh, may you keep up the, the great work you're doing. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Two of our three musical pieces today relate to our choral scholars here at First Presbyterian Church. Our choral scholar program was started 35 years ago by my predecessor, John Russell. It provides a small stipend for singers from the College of Worcester to serve as soloists and section leaders in our choir. While the choir is on hiatus right now, we do have the ability to have our choral scholars join us remotely, and this week is their first anthem. Annika Balish returns as our soprano. Our alto choral scholar is new to us, Emily Hazaki. Welcome, Emily. Our tenor, Will McCullough, is also returning, although he's studying remotely from Pittsburgh. And our baritone, Carter Rogers, is here on campus. Their anthem is a beautiful arrangement of Come Labor On, by, arranged by John Ferguson. The prelude today is also related to choral scholars. It was written by Paul Winchester, who was a choral scholar here. In 2011, just before he left and graduated from the College of Worcester, he left us with two wonderful gifts, an anthem for the choir and an organ sonata for me. You'll hear the second movement of that today as the prelude. Finally, the postlude today is a joyous piece by the American composer Dan Locklear from 1988. It's from a suite called Rubrics, and it relates to the uh, Book of Order uh, in the Episcopal Church. The rubrics are instructions which appear as part of congregational worship there. And the rubric for today is, and thanksgivings may follow. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.
Good morning. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. From north and south, from east and west, we come. God's people called to God's table where simple grace nourishes us. From down the street to across town, from single households to apartment dwellers, God's people are called to community where we live and serve one another. From every class, every race, every status, from little ones with dreams to elders with overflowing hearts, God's people are called to witness to God's hope, to offer peace to a shattered world. Let us pray. Help us, O God, to recognize the times in which we live and to choose to live faithfully. Grant us courage to stand with and speak for those at risk. As we are able, help us to preserve community, extend hospitality, and redeem the time you entrust into our hands. Amen. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession. Forgiving God, we confess that we are a fearful people. Too often we live in the midst of the abundance of your world and are afraid that there is not enough. We covet what little our neighbors have. We hoard the good news of your creation. We make idols of scarcity and want in order to control the world's resources. Forgive us. Gently ease our grip and open our hands and our eyes that we, trusting in your grace, may truly live out the heart and soul of the gospel, to love you by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Spirit's presence is in us, between us, and embracing us always. Through the unity of this spirit, we are shaped into a community that lives to fulfill love's expectations. In the joy of the forgiven, let us live into that hope for ourselves and for the world. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning. I wanted to talk a little bit today about God's love for us. Sounds like a simple thing, but sometimes we get wrapped up in who we are and we think that God loves us more. I like baseball. I like the color red. I like chocolate chip cookies. But not everybody else likes all those things. I like the beach. Some people like the mountains. I like the summer. Some people like the winter. And so sometimes we get wrapped up in God loving us more than them. That's not how it works. All of a sudden you realize that God loves them just as much as he loves us. It doesn't matter if they like mountains and cool weather, crisp leaves crunching under your feet, or the waves in the ocean and the sand under your toes. It doesn't matter. God loves us all. And that reminded me of a parable in the Bible about the workers. And they're all working. Some are working harder than others. Some maybe aren't working at all. But at the end of the day, they all get the same amount of pay. And they're kind of like, um, I worked really hard today. And he didn't work that hard. Why are we getting the same amount? And it's like God's love for us. It doesn't matter what we do. He shares his love with us no matter what. So as we approach these next couple weeks in our lives, and there are going to be some big decisions that we're going to have to make, remember that God loves us no matter what, whether we're a them or an us, his pay and love in our hearts are the same. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and continually loving us. Help us to see your love and show others your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I now invite you to continue our worship together by joining me in our prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray.
Gracious God, the story of your love makes us realize that there is a world of others beyond ourselves who need your help and grace through our impassioned prayers and empowered actions. So we boldly bring our prayers to you, asking for strength and courage to enact them in your hurting world. For those who suffer pain and for those whose loneliness is soul-destroying, for those whose minds are disturbed and for those who live lives of quiet despair, for those who have not had the opportunities to realize their potentials, for those who are satisfied with something less than the life for which they were made, for those who know their guilt, their shallowness, their need, but do not know your community of grace and forgiveness. For those who suffer physical, emotional, and mental traumas, especially those whom we know in our own circles, and those we name silently in our hearts, and those who are unknown to us. We pray for refugees in so many parts of our world. We pray for the victims of natural disasters here in our own country, out west with the fires, on the southern coasts with the storms. And let us connect our remembering of our brothers and sisters here in this country with those across the world that are suffering similar disasters or famine. And of course, the entire world under the scourge of this pandemic. We pray for victims of terror. We pray for the pain and suffering death that is happening even as we lift these prayers to you. We pray for members of our own church family that are alone, that are hurting, that are sick. We especially remember Helen Jacob, who is suffering right now with COVID-19. We lift her up to you and we hold her family in our prayers. Our ultimate hope is in your gracious, universal healing and wholeness. But in the meantime, work in us your calling and our response to the needs, hurts, and injustices that are ours to do and ours to make right for your kingdom to come. And hear us now as we join our voices, praying the ancient prayer we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
gospel lesson for today, coming from the 20th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, is one, one of those passages that I would put in the category called tough sayings of Jesus or tough teachings of Jesus. It uh, is a story that is almost unintelligible in uh, our 20th, 21st century America, our capitalist country, or really in most of the, um, most of Europe and the other capital-driven countries, uh, democracies and whatnot in the world. Uh, it is interesting that it starts right out at the top by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then proceeds to <clears throat> tell the, the story or the parable. So let us listen to this passage, see if we can make any sense out of it, see if it has a, a word, a word for, for us today, with keeping in mind that this is one of Jesus' descriptions of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. <clears throat> but he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last one the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? Or, as it says in the original Greek, is your eye evil because I am good? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Inside and outside the church, our society is based on personal achievement, hard work, and reward. For the most part, that is how the world operates. But then we have this parable from Jesus, a story that seems to turn the world on its head, a tale 
that would forever challenge the way the world operates. As the story goes, the owner of a vineyard hired the work crew he needed to harvest his crop early one morning. Then around nine o'clock, he went out to the marketplace and saw another group of unemployed laborers. He sent them off to the vineyard, promising to pay them whatever was right. They knew it would not be a full day's wage, but something was certainly better than nothing. The landowner went out again at noon and again at three o'clock and made the same arrangement with those he found without work. At five o'clock, there were still unemployed workers standing around in the square with nothing to do. Perhaps they were the bottom of the labor pool, good for nothing or over the hill. Maybe they were poorly skilled or lacking in motivation, not fit for much of anything. They could have been the ones who never get picked for the team, who are always left out, who are always overlooked. Or perhaps they were just unlucky. The landowner did not seem to care who they were or why they were standing around. With only an hour left to work, he sent them into the vineyard with the others. When the day was done, everyone was called together to receive their wages. And that is when the trouble started. The last hired were paid first. Those who had worked just one hour received a whole day's pay. Imagine their astonishment. They had not expected to get much. They figured it would be another can of beans supper for the children. Instead, they were paid as if they had worked all day. So now, those laborers who had worked all day were primed for a bonus. In any economy, anywhere, any time, those who work 12 hours deserve more compensation than those who work three or five, and they certainly deserve more than those who have worked only one hour. And yet, what did they get? The same day's pay as everyone else. It is not fair. It seems unjust. The landowner is not playing by the rules we know. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. In our economy, it is assumed that the first are first because they earn it, and the last are last because they cannot or will not work for it. The current mood of our country heaps scorn on advocates of welfare programs, quota systems, entitlements. And yet, in this parable, the only people who felt entitled were those who had bargained for a fair wage and worked all day for it. When the latecomers also got a day's wage, then the all-day workers thought they were entitled to more. One group got what they bargained for. The rest were surprised by an unexpected gift. Grace fell on those who knew they deserved it and on those who never could have imagined it. In the end, whether through bargaining or by unexpected surprise, all the laborers got what they needed, a full day's wage. This is not the way of the world. But, the story tells us, this is how things are in the kingdom of God. All are given what they need to survive as God's 
sons and daughters and children in a harsh and competitive world. And Matthew's Jesus said he was bringing the kingdom of God to earth. When you think about it, we are all just day laborers as far as life is concerned. Day laborers are powerless. They are at the mercy of others to provide employment. In the same way, we are powerless to secure life. As preacher John Claypool puts it, we live day to day by the grace and generosity of that one who has called us into being. The landowner gave the same daily wa wage to all the workers, whether they thought they deserved more or feared they deserved less. Jesus tells a story that says, God gives the same daily grace to all God's children, whether they deserve it or not. In the story, the landowner is not paying on the basis of merit. He is paying on the basis of need. The landowner is not trying to be fair. He is being gracious. And Jesus says the same is true of God. We can grumble about what we thought we should have gotten, or we can rejoice at such unexpected, undeserved generosity. And the grumbling or rejoicing may depend on where we think we stand in this story. As we look into our world, we can see both those who have worked hard all day and the Johnny-come-latelys with their hands out, the deserving and the decidedly undeserving. But it is the gracious landowner who will make the final call. At some time or another, we may find ourselves in both places, standing with those who have worked hard and feeling deserving of extra, extra wages, or slouching with those who just hope against hope that they might get anything at all. It is a gracious God who gives to all. Not what we deserve, but what we need. Instead of grumbling about unmerited grace, God invites us to rejoice. For in Claypool's words, the secret of human joy is in sharing what we have with others rather than hoarding everything for ourselves. It has not been popular or politically expedient to consider the least and the last for some long time now. But neither was it expedient in Jesus' day. In our economy, as in first century Roman times, you get what you earn. In God's economy, we receive what we never deserved. May it be our calling in this time and place to bring these two economies together. May we not be envious because God is generous. Amen. Nature 
God whose giving knows no ending. From your rich and endless store, all at peace in health and freedom, races joined the church made one. And how do we continue to answer Christ's ageless call? Healing, teaching, and reclaiming serving God by loving all. Those hymn verses, I think, capture some of the essence of this gospel parable from Matthew chapter 20. That God's store, rich store, is endless. We don't merit it, we are graced with it. And I think that's the challenge for us, that we see others in that same way, equally graced, equally deserving, no matter social status, economic status, racial status, any kind of physical differences, all are graced. And then our responsibility as members of a democracy is to work to change unjust systems right here at home. It comes at the ballot box. It comes by urging our leaders to reflect more the kingdom of God than the kingdom of America. So let that be our call, our call as we head further into this season, this fall season. Let's see if we can look at each other, perhaps differently, most especially equally. As you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, and that together 
we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness, loving service, this and every day of our lives. May God's hope, God's peace, God's love, God's joy abide with you.